I'm here. I'm ready. You ready to go? I can't hear anything. Jennifer, how are you? How are you? How are you? I don't know where our opener is today. I know. I what happened there? <laughs> I don't know. I lost it. I, I, I have to tell you this. Mercury is in retrograde and oh, all yeah. kinds of things are. I sent our first, maybe this is the most famous. I won't even say famous because we've had famous before. I'm going to tell you, I think one of the most important guests we could ever have on is on with us today. While Mercury is in retrograde? I know. What were we thinking? So I sent him a Google calendar and uh -huh. I'm just telling you Mercury is in retrograde. Well, he, he is backstage right now. He does happen to be the most handsome chef I've personally ever met in my life. And when he spent his time here in Vegas, um, I was we would spend a lot, a lot of time together. And I would tell you that I did not meet one girl because they would all flock right to him. And it would be he's like got, he's got crazy charisma as much he's got charisma and creativity. Wow. Which is a powerful combination. Well, should we should we bring him on? Should you announce him? Should we drum roll him? Well, I'm gonna let you take this one. Uh, for a number of reasons, because I'm going to gush and then you're going to tell me stop gushing. No, you can gush for him because I gush for him. I gush. He was like, stop gushing. I'm like, I can't stop gushing. I mean, the projects that this guy's been involved with, the creativity that this guy's been involved with, and yeah, he knows know. it. Like, he's very humble, though. So he doesn't want to hear us talking about how fabulous I mean, he is. I know. But he's also a chef who has been in the period of time in the last 25 years, mm -hmm. uh, one of the most powerful towering pivotal figures in pushing the boundaries of creativity. We're going to put three chefs in this category. We're going to put Chef David Burke, mm -hmm. Chef Jose Andres, and Chef Ferran Adria. To my mind, those are the three most extraordinarily creative artists working in the medium of food and hospitality today. Wow. Well, you didn't meet the guy at the Waffle House that I met. What that guy could do with waffles, it was on Saturday. <laughs> All right, let me get Dave. Let's get David on. David was kind enough to write an endorsement on the back of the book. If I could find yeah, the dang book sitting here, hold on. Let me let's bring him on. So he and you both wrote an endorsement along with Chef Gordon and Jonathan Chebin, the food god. That's and right. we have to, you know, but David was a guy that was there when I began. So let's bring him on. Ladies Hello, Chef. Look at this guy. Ah. Look, look at that face. Where has that face been? Happy nice to see you guys. Chef, it's wonderful to see you again and to hear your voice and to have you here with us. It's been far too long. How are you? Yeah. I'm okay, considering I'm okay. Nice to be yeah. looking at you guys and talking. I'm Where's the puppet? There considering, uh, you know, we're in a different different world these days. Yeah, you know? for sure. Um, Chef David Thank Burke. Thank you for that great introduction. I want to meet the guy at the Waffle House, too. Well, yeah, I knew that you'd want to meet the guy at the Waffle House. <laughs> Remember the yeah. good old days at the Venetian? Oh, and then before that, you had the good old days at the uh, tropical uh, Hawaiian tropic zone. Remember that? Uh, yeah, oh, sure. sure. I have a selected memory, so I remember the good parts. Yeah. The good, right? <laughs> I love the Venetian. That was a great restaurant. And, uh, oh, it was unbelievable. And it, it was good to be part of the Vegas uh, scene at the time. It was really, really exciting. And... Uh, there's a lot of good food out there. It really is. Let's start our conversation off um, by going back and, and talking a little bit about what we'll call for this moment in time, the good old days. Uh, where, uh, Chef, would you like us to start? I, I, I want to talk very, um, what is it? What very is limitedly it? because we really want to give you as much time Michael, don't disappear because well, you're part of the good old days. But yeah, I want to give you as much time as possible. To I'm only disappearing, Jennifer, because my computer keeps making weird noises and I've got to figure out how to stop the noises. Okay. Because it's so, not music to any of our ears. I'll tell you that. Chef, take us back to, to when you considered that, that time when we sort of woke up about food in general. Uh, well, and I, can tell, I can tell you that I got started very young. And uh, I got into New York City. I was working after my trip to uh, CIA. I went to Europe and a lot. And then I started working for Wally Maloof 
upstate New York, in New York and Greenwich, Connecticut. And then I, I entered New York City after being trained by him. Uh, and he had trained Charlie Palmer, a lot of other people at the Cope Basque. And the Cope Basque in the 1980, early 80s, late 70s in New York City was the one of the premier places uh, where, where, if that was the River Cafe or the uh, Chez Panisse of New York City uh, back back then. Um, so I went into, I started to work for Daniel Blue. I got hired by Danielle in 1984 and soon after moved over to the River Cafe with Charlie Palmer um, underneath the Brooklyn Bridge. And at, at the time, Larry Ford Jones had left, Charlie took over. And that, that was the beginning. I wouldn't call it the good old days, but those are the percolating days. Those were the days of uh, enthusiasm, excitement, uh, being a chef. There was a lot of pride in putting the white coat on as opposed to 10 years earlier where being a chef, you were a half a moron at least by anyone in your family and anybody else in your school was like, why the hell do you want to be a chef? That's like, that's like being a, it's like going home and saying, dad, I, I want to be a janitor. You know, <laughs> I, I think I want to clean hotel rooms for a living. I know I get, I'm, I'm a little, I'm, I got, I'm a B plus student, but I think I can, I can do it, you know? So anyway, that was the, the respect factor came on board and at the, at, at, in the river cafe era, Charlie moved on to Oriole. I moved to do pastries in Paris, came back to River Cafe. Charlie and I uh, together made a wonderful team at the River Cafe. And some of the students and, and younger chefs that worked for us were moving on into uh, uh, getting positions. A couple of those went and opened Aqua in San Francisco. And, you know, things started, people started jumping out of New York and LA and go and San Francisco and going into other cities to work. Chicago became a great food scene uh, as well. But the good old days was the beginning of the blue ribbon at in New York City. And that would have been the early 90s, I'd say, or late 80s when, uh, you know, the Beard Awards meant a lot. New York City was the was the capital of food and the dining next and the West and the, and the East Coast, of course, the West Coast. Is and Everybody that worked in the kitchens back then was destined to most likely be a great chef. That was the goal. You didn't just mosey to work. You went in there and you chopped up blah, you know, you, 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 you crushed rocks and it worked. And you got in early and you stayed late and you stayed out even later and you got in earlier. And it was this, this fuel and energy that, uh, that defined uh, uh, the, the renegadeness of wanting to succeed at all costs. And I think there was a, a, a galaxy of people, chefs, both men and women, that fit into that mold that went on to do really wonderful things in, in, the, uh, in, in, in American cooking. So that chef, was the beginning of that. Chef, did, did a lot of the young men and women that got into the industry at that point, whether they went through uh, the CIA, Cornell, Johnson and Wales, or another program, uh, ICE in New York, which was yeah. formerly French culinary. Uh, did everybody that got into the business dream of being a restaurateur and having their own place, was that at that time the gold no. standard? That's was that the dream? Way. It's a great question, but it certainly wasn't for me because there was no, but when I decided to be a chef in 77, I was in high school. There was no chef that owned a restaurant. There was no chef that owned more than two, one restaurant. There was no, you know, there wasn't, you had the James Beard cookbooks and Julia Child, but you didn't have the guy in the white coat who was a restaurant chef right. being an author and an entrepreneur at the same time. You wore the one coat. Either you were a TV chef like James Beard or a Julia Child or us, whoever. Yannick, you know, one of those guys, the Galping Gourmet, or you were a chef in a restaurant or a country cook, mostly European at the high level. You didn't have a, the, the aspiration to do all of it didn't exist yet. So you didn't really, you couldn't compare. There was nothing to reach for you. It didn't exist right. yet. You, we kind of, I think we sensed something that was there. Most of it was passion for myself. The goal was to be the quarterback of my kitchen. I just wanted to be the guy in charge of what came yeah. out of my kitchen and be responsible for those, that the, the canvas that we put our food on. And that was the goal. And then as you, as you conquered that and you decided to make, I, you know, my pastry needs to be better. My, how does my creme brulee compete with Charlie Palmer's after I worked for him for two years? What am I going to do differently? How, I where, mean, where's my edge? You know what I mean? What am I Well, gonna, Chef, I mean, isn't the answer that they should be exactly the same? Because you were trained in an era when 
there was a gold standard and and things were the way that they were and and you know when you were presented with a creme brulee that's what a creme brulee is supposed to be and it wasn't quite so much the realm of the artist as it was the perfectionist well that's that's what i was presented and that's how i was taught but that's not how i proceeded because I, 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 in fact was, you I, are the I artist was the, i was the why not guy I wasn't yeah. the why guy. I was. I figured out why they did it that way. And I said, why can't we do it this way? Mine. I want to charge two bucks more for mine. What do I need to do? I need to attach a flying mango to it. I'm going to attach a flying mango to it. I'm going to make sure it gets more attention. I also started the River Cafe, which has the most tremendous view in America of a restaurant. So I needed to get people's eyes on the plate, not out the window. Right. So we really had an Instagram approach way before Instagram on how to get people to look and understand the building of a dish and and how that it wasn't really necessarily uh i want to compete with the view and may, maybe it was but it wasn't we didn't sit down and write that it just happened that way you know chef how, i want to make sure that that i give you uh the opportunity to to talk about this and i and i know how humble you are but, but please accept this with the love and respect that i've had for you for decades our conversations have always been my favorite whenever we've had them uh, because you are an artist and you're not an artist because you are attempting to wag the dog from the tail. You're an artist because authentically and organically the art of food comes through you in a way that is novel and inventive. And unlike anything that anyone has done, you've described it just now as the why not approach. There's so much more to it. You truly are an Thank artist you. in this realm. Would you talk about being an artist? Were you, from the time you were a child, someone who thought in those artistic terms? Do you identify as an artist even more than chef? Um, thank you for the compliment. I, I don't, I, I, as I get older, I look at things more, art, I've always looked at things artistically. I'm not very artistic on paper, at least I don't think so. Uh, I'm very creative in mind. My nickname in high school was Imaginif Berkey. That was one of my nicknames because I had a great imagination. My imagination is, uh, uh, it gets me in trouble, has, has got me in trouble, but it also allows me to bend the rules and constantly question why things, is that good enough? Why can't we do it this way? Does it make more sense? So as times change, nothing is ever no presentation or style of a dish is safe enough to rest on its laurels. And that, and if you look back at the art culinaries and some of the books that we've been featured in, and even some of the chefs before me, and I have had that opportunity recently because of the pandemic to unpack a thousand cookbooks and start looking at them. <laughs> and you start to look and say, what was I thinking? But back then it was really, and then you get really, you see a dish that you did 30 years ago when you're like, wow, that's still relevant today. It's still so far ahead of its time and uh, in, 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 in its style and present. Then you tack on top of that, that you had to make 300 covers that night with that kind of dish. And that's where the real pride comes in, that you can actually execute something on that level uh, in, in a profitable and busy environment with a team of uh, culinarians that, that get the fact that this is war. This is this is war on a Saturday night, and we gotta win, you know. And that's that whole energy and that whole uh, addiction of being part of a restaurant kitchen when the game begins or the lights go on or the curtain opens and all that. But from a back to the artistic part, I think, like I said, there's a, there's something built within the process of thinking about how to present and how to uh, how to combine flavors. And also, I think what, one of the things I've done well is put myself in a diner's seat before I design a dish. What would that diner want to see? Like, how would I feel if that was presented to me? Where's that wow factor? Where's that smile? Where's that sense of humor? Where's that whimsy? And or, uh, not on every dish. Not every dish has to be the, the, in that way. So a great steak and cream spinach can be wonderfully done, but how do we age that steak better than anybody else. We create a salt room, get a US patent on it, and make sure that we treat that meat like gold. And so that so it's not always in the 
presentation, sometimes it's in the technique and the mm -hmm. style. So, and that's really honestly the fun, challenging part of, of, of creating. But, but in order to create, in my opinion, and to do things correctly, like an architect would build a building, you know, you need to know how to build a foundation. So you need to know the classic reason why. Why are we serving pickles on a hamburger? Why is there oranges with a duck and applesauce with a pork and mint jelly with mint? And all those little nuances of things that relate to either history, geography, lack of transportation, things that were, were became really classic dishes, why they became classic, how they got how they become unfavorable because they get put in the wrong hands. Creme brulee could be a great example of that. It's when done correctly and followed by the master recipe, executed beautiful. When you buy it at a supermarket shop, right, it's become a, a, a not such a special name anymore. So the, there has to be some careful. A great Caesar salad is probably really hard to find. Right. You know, uh, Chef, I want to ask you, one of the things that I've always considered about you and your work is that I've always thought of you as a painter who painted with flavor. Now that may or may not be apt and it may not be how you see yourself, but that's how I always have, have thought of you. And so when I read your words or your books or your recipes or, or the events that you've had a hand in or the things that you've produced or the products that you've conceived of and developed, it's always with this sense that flavor was pivotal. Where does flavor fit into your creativity matrix? Well, again, thank you. I, when I first learned and started cooking, you know, everything was about salt, pepper, and fresh herbs, cream and butter, and acid from wine, and some lemon, because I was trained in some of the great French restaurants. And then the beauty of what American food is and, and breaking into and uh, traveling is another way. I lived in Brooklyn and I lived near Atlantic Avenue and it had all the Middle Eastern spice markets and all of the, the mustard oil I brought to the market. There was things that I would just go shop and bring them in. And we had, you know, the River Cafe was an experimental stage and we could really, we could, we could do things. And we were so curious, you know, we were talking about a sauce the other day. We had five gallons of lemon juice one day in the walk-in and I just cleaned the walk-in, threw it on a stove and forgot about it. But by four or five hours later, there was this caramelized syrup that was made strictly from reduced lemon juice and everyone forgot what it was. So we tasted it. It was so acidically delicious, but acidic to the point where you almost got a pimple on your tongue right away. <laughs> and then I remember it to almost to the day, and this is back in 88, 89. So it's like, okay, I grabbed this guy and I said, get some honey. Let's go to the spice. And we made something called a Moroccan barbecue sauce because we had the things. That, and I got to tell you, that's one of the dishes everybody that works for me takes. And we, so it came from just, just do it, man. Let's get something on it. Let's find a use for this. So that's a force for, that's a, a creativity based on utilization. And then there's creativity based on seasonality. Then there's creativity. Sometimes you find a plate or a vessel and you're like, what will fit in here perfectly to amuse somebody? It could have a lid on it. It could be a, a clothesline for bacon that we design ourselves because why wouldn't you want to render the fat off with a blowtorch and, and, and have something that's more shareable and Instagrammable? So there's, all, there's, there's levels of processes. But back to layering. What do we got? There we go. I started to eat myself. You started getting the, the, the flavors from Asian cuisine because we're exposed to it in America in certain cities. And also the sense of heat. You know, the, the fact that I love a little bit of heat, even in my dessert now, you know, because it, it sends a message to the brain, you know. And then you start, and I'm not a scientist, but I know what I like. And same as with art. And same as with food look and same as with with wine you know what you like you don't have to be a, an expert in the picasso's blue period or what growth this wine came from to know what you like and with food which is what i'm an expert at i know how to make something dance on the palate and one of the techniques is in that when i made the pastrami salmon this is strictly by taking what they do to pastrami beef and analyzing in my head, so okay, I'll do this. To, I'll utilize salmon bellies, and I created pastrami salmon in the 80s. And then realizing when you hide cayenne pepper into reduced molasses, and then you taste it, you get the sweet, 
And then when that sugar melts, you get the heat. So then you can learn how to layer things on somewhere. And when you take a bite of something, you hit, it's almost like encapsulating flavor, which is what they do, with, the food scientists do with certain snack products. You know, that it's a time release flavor. So some of that stuff, we don't do every dish like that. I don't want to, you know, but when you start to think that way, it becomes natural. It's like, it's like some, you know, you, it's like tying your shoe. You don't think about it anymore. And if you taste something, you say, add lime zest, add, add some chili peppers, add a little bit of rose petal, add this and that. And, the other. and all of a sudden you walk away and people are like, ah, man, I don't know, but this is good, you know? And that's kind of fun. And I had so much fun doing that under the pandemic because I've been cooking at home a lot. And I, most chefs never really cook at home. And I realized how, much, how joyful it is and why I loved cooking so much, because I'm, I'm home alone. I've been home alone <clears throat> cooking. And I got to be some. Well, you have a partner, D David. You have a companion that you cook with. I watch. I watch. I watch. I see Left the companion. Okay. Yes. Yeah, I got a little company. He's awfully quiet, though. He's very quiet right <laughs> now. I, don't, I thought he was going to be on the show today. I didn't know what was happening. I, 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 I'll get him on. He's downstairs taking a nap. <laughs> But with the Step sometimes back. I would just stop and take a taste of something and be like, wow, and 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 laugh sometimes, or just, you know, and then enjoy it. And there's so much joy that comes from good flavor, you know. It's just you know we forget about it. We're such it's such a privilege to be able to eat really good food and dine out in good restaurants. But sometimes I think we forget, and I think we were reminded of when the restaurant started to reopen about my God, hand me a menu, <laughs> get me, I want to order something. Chef, um, I, I, you're being very generous with your time. We love having you here with us. Please know that that this table is always yours. There's always a seat at the head of our table for you, and you're welcome anytime and every time. Um, when you were just describing something that you tasted in 1989, you tasted it and described it in your mind in this very present moment in such a way that it made me feel like you were tasting it again. In a lifetime career of food and flavors, it's difficult for those of us in the industry to explain to people that even if you've had a million tastes, there are still things that stand out to this day that are so revelatory in the moment that we discover them and taste them that they're the ones that break through and stick with us. Would you talk a little bit about that and maybe one or two of the other flavors food moments you've had in your career that in a, that in a lifetime of extraordinary moments of food and flavor uh, that you've experienced stand out even among those? Yeah, I, I, I'll give a couple examples. Uh, um, the pastrami salmon one was one because I had been working in Norway and I was making gravlax every day and I had all these salmon bellies and we were smoking our own stuff at the River Cafe and I hated to throw things away. So we made pastrami salmon from the bellies of the salmon. Eventually it became its own business. Uh, but I remember also, uh, this was in 1988 also. And I, like when I talk about that sauce with the lemon juice, I can taste it. I remember the cook who's now a surgeon <laughs> who was with me <laughs> making it. And I remember making pump soufflés with a guy named Dwayne LaPuma, who's now a uh, teacher at the Colonies of America. I remember being in a certain place when that aha moment hits and I say, this is going to be something. This is going to be on menus. This is, this is, this is a, this is a work of art. This is something that's keeper. You know, some days hey, there's a ton of things that are not keepers, but not every special of the day is going to be something that becomes a, uh, uh, a, a repertoire dish for me. Swordfish chop is another one. We created a fish chop from a piece of swordfish. And I remember standing next to Alan Stillman, the founder of uh, TJ Fridays and Smith and Walensky in a construction zone in our kitchen with a big gnarly piece of swordfish I got at the fish market. And I whacked it up like a butcher. I'm very good at butchering. And I showed him this hunk of meat with a, the collarbone on it. And he looked at me and looked like, he looked at me, you know, when the dog hears a certain whistle and her head goes sideways. He looked, huh? he looked at it like that and was like, yeah. that's incredible. He goes, what he's like, and even like Brian Miller, the New York Times writer, he wrote in the review that I stuck a veal bone inside a sword steak. Which is completely, <laughs> so we, we, we invented a dish and Thomas Keller gives us credit in his book about that. And things to invent a cut of meat or dish is very difficult. 
you know, it's and but it. I had eaten a, a, a I had eaten a trout one night down in the village on a date, a whole trout, and I cut the head off and I saw this baby little chop and I wrote on the napkin, little fish, little chop, big fish, big chop, and I had kept that napkin in my you know. That's so cool. For, for, for years until I met Alan Stillman, the king of Smith and Walensky steakhouses. And I said, this is the moment to get my ass down a fish market and find a big fish shop. So that was that forced. And it was about the connection and the combination. And we trademarked that. We, we gave the tags out. It was very, very, it was a marketing genius item. Uh, flavored oils was another thing that John George, uh, uh, Thomas Keller, myself, in the 80s put on the market there was a big article in the new york times and from my recollection the river cafe was the place and i refer to that a lot because those were highly experimental days before right. a lot of this became and i was eating pizza again late at night and the oil that came out of that slice of pizza when you curl it up was red and it was hitting my napkin and i was like is that tomato oil or is that cheese oil what is that and that's when I started making tomato oil, curry oil, shrimp oil, and using those oils as, as, as a paint on a plate for really light, beautiful flavors and getting away from brown sauce and beurre blanc and all that, and being able to create some of that. And that curry oil mixed with the Moroccan barbecue sauce. So that was, those are all items that I, I can remember where I was and how it was created. The pork shank is another dish. I didn't yeah, create the pork shank. That's but I his ate it. specialty, the pork I shank. <laughs> I love this story. Tell the story. I love this story. Listen, guys, I, I, I'm going to, um, I want to also make sure we find out, just Chef, how many patents and trademarks do you have for food things? Because people don't realize how prolific you've been. Well, I stopped doing it because it's just too hard to maintain, but I trademarked up pastrami salmon, swordfish chop, cheesecake pops. Cheesecake pops was another great invention. Cake pops in general, which I put on the market in 92. Uh, I, I have a trademark on uh, a patent on dry aging beef process and another patent on a, a waiter's tray that expired. And we've had some trademarks on several other items including garnishes and chips and all that, you know, the herb potatoes, the flavors. <laughs> but, but, you know, I love those. Food. And honestly, what we really wanted to do is just be the ones that got the credit for the creation. There's not a lot of that. It's very hard to trademark food and make money off it. I mean, you can trademark the brand and the name. For example, the bacon on a clothesline would have been a great idea to trademark. Trademarking the clothesline, the designing the clothesline would have made more economical sense. But at the end of the day, and like Singapore Airlines once said when I consulted for them, you know, I asked them once, I said, don't you guys ever get tired of being copied? You know, everybody, and their answer was this. And I think it's beautiful. They said, if people are copying us, they'll never be better than us. So I've always kind of, you know, figured, now what, there'll be another creation. And food is meant to be shared, recipes, cookbooks. I mean, if there is, so listen, if I can invent an item that's a household item that I can make money on, I certainly would pursue the trade, the patent and trademark. But it gets very expensive trying to chase people around that, use your patent, and you need to have a large company. It takes a lot of time. And, and uh, you know, again, I, it takes away from what I really do, what I really want to do is continue to, to uh, create well, and cook. Well, and I didn't mean to interrupt your pork yeah. shank story, guys. You, you I'm gonna... My most favorite thing that David has specifically well, made hey. once for my dinner out of the blue in Vegas. I was lucky enough to literally be with David when he opened two restaurants from literally from, from, from construction, right? I mean, honestly. I'm going to yeah. listen offline. What do you mean you're going to yeah. listen offline? Oh, there she goes. I mean, we had so much fun, right, when you were here in Vegas. But tell the, tell everybody about the pork shank because then I got uh, – I got a special question for you from, from one of our okay. viewers. Well, the pork shank, listen, I was over in uh, Munich working uh, for the New Zealand Venison Board and teaching uh, a bunch of chefs about their product. We went out to Tantris, which is a great restaurant one night, and then we went to a hot brow house. In that hot brow house, I had a huge, this is Weinhox, and a big punk of a pork shank. We were opening, I thought it was wonderful. I brought that idea back to uh, Park Avenue Cafe, which was a great restaurant that opened in the 90s. Alan Stillman and I were opening Maloney and Porcelli, another steakhouse. And I said, let's put this pork shank. And I made it like duck confit. I cooked it in the fat for five hours, cured it for three days. And then I deep fried it. It was crispy. It was wonderful. It was, and it was pork. 
and I made applesauce with jalapenos. It's called firecracker applesauce, sour uh, cat with a sauerkraut. Really, I mean, a phenomenal dinner. It wasn't pretty. It was gorgeous, handsome, handsome. right? Not sexy, but handsome. It was a handsome. It was a ha but everything handsome. you do, yeah, everything I, you I do. And anyway, the so here's what happens. We're doing our menu tasting before we open the steakhouse, and these guys own great steakhouse, and they're fighting with me, and they said that's never going to sell. We're not going to put on the menu, and I take a fit. Because I know this dish is great. And and they see how upset I am. Yeah, probably young 30s from that. And they're like, okay, okay, let's put on a menu for two weeks. It doesn't sell, we take it off. I'm like, fair enough, right? It goes on a menu. It's a gangbuster, not blockbuster hit. Sells like crazy. <laughs> In fact, 1996, USA Today, it's the number one dish in America. Best dish of the year. And right. you know, number two is like, you know, Daniel Blutes, truffle scallops, and that, you know, all these other really classic French dishes. But it was really, it was the first time we really put white meat pork on a fancier restaurant. We charged 18 or 19 bucks in 96 when we did it, probably. But we sold a gazillion and it stayed on. And that was the, the, the birth of the crackling pork shank, the way it, you see it sometimes in Europe, but you would be hard pressed to find a pork shank on any menu in America, unless it was a hot brow house back then. So that, right. that's what comes from traveling and taking chances. And, and then the other part of that is sticking to what you believe in and being able to stand up and say, no, I think this is going to sell. Let's give it a try. Instead of saying, ah, oh, that never sells. Ah, oh, this doesn't work. Uh, you know, you got to stick to the guns. Right. Well, that, and that makes, I, I and that, but... that, I remember how upset I was that day. The, I remember you telling me that story 15 years ago. That yeah. right, and still, but when but you coming up with Charlie and and all these guys, you guys are a different breed of the chefs today, and you know that. Like there is so much of that competitive. We're gonna do this. We're gonna bang this out. I mean, you know, now everybody's a little bit older. You know, Charlie's. You know, he's a little fancier with his you know Napa and all that kind of stuff. Yeah. But but I mean, even the kids were working his kitchen. The guys that are, that are coming out now, Barry and. Brian Massey and all these guys yeah. that are coming up from Charlie from the day, they have that fire in them, right? right. Yeah. And it was like the well, non-fear. It's the non-fear. It's like I'm going to do this. It's also the professional, uh, the professional competitiveness in you. And uh, I, I think there's a little bit of a softer walk these days than there was in general, and that's okay. Yeah. Um, but and I still think there's some really seriously competitive kitchens, but every. And you gotta understand, we we as the young American chefs were were at the beginning, the first breed of the first first line of American chefs out of the CIA and into the ranks, competing with the great French chefs from all cities around America, because the American chef was still, you know, what he was a country club guy or he was this guy or this guy, <laughs> and all of a sudden, you know, we started saying, well, I don't need a cream sauce. I don't, it doesn't have to be the same dish. You know, the, the one thing that's great about French food and one thing that's not great about French food, at least 30, 40 years ago, is they, they followed the recipe to the T. So when you got squab with, with uh, cabbage and lard owns and all that, that's what you got. When you got a soul bone femme, you got that way. You got a Dover soul. With it. Then we were able to change presentations and change, you know, add different flavors. And, and because we had, the, we had the liberty to do that because cool. American cuisine didn't have boundaries. And that was that's what that's what was really brilliant about what we could get away with in a modern American restaurant. We didn't have to, you could do a taco. Well, we didn't do tacos back then, but now you can. You know, we would taco. Yeah, now you're doing lobster tacos. Well, now you <laughs> figure a way to how to get a twenty dollar taco. You know. <laughs> yeah, it's brilliant. So, so this is Amanda. Amanda has a question. As an artist, chef at the forefront of modern and progressive cooking, virus aside, pre-virus. Where do you see the trajectory of food trends moving in the future? Now, Amanda, her family is very big in the food business. Her father is Meatloaf, the okay. singer. The singer Meatloaf. Oh, Have you heard really? it? Yeah. yeah, <laughs> so, yeah. And she's the biggest foodie. So she's tried, literally, Amanda and her sister traveled around the world with her dad, right? Okay. And have eaten everywhere and everything, hundreds, however many times he's been around the world on tour. So she's very, you know, love, great palate. Brilliant of industry. So well, that's a good question. I, I think 
like we can touch on flavors. The flavors become a little bit more complex with as people get more educated and travel the world. I think plant based food you'll see more of it. I don't think it's going to dominate every menu, but you'll see more of that, and you'll see more of that incorporated in a creative way. More grains as well. Proteins becoming smaller. The, the modern day steakhouse, I think, will have a a six ounce steak with grains as opposed to a 30 ounce steak with nothing. And uh, again, economics always play a role in, in what we're eating in the future and also the style of uh, the style of restaurants. Like we'll be down to the bistro feel again for quite a while next year until the economy gets back in, whether it's a bistro, brasserie, American cafe, you know, some, it'll be harder to launch fine dining right off the get go or very expensive depending on your location. But I think there's an eye toward always flavor, always quality. And I think a little bit more plant and grains and less on the protein. So that'll be it. And it'll be interesting to see how every, because everyone's a little nervous right now, obviously, to reopen, right? And all this crazy stuff that's happening. But what I find is the guys sort of, they could reach back into them with that fire that they had inside themselves at one point to open, to go into the business that everybody told you you were crazy to go in. If they can find that, they seem to be, they seem to be overcoming like, you know, and I see, you know, here, you know, I've lived here for Vegas since for, I wish I wasn't, I wish I was with you. Right. But you know, you left, you got to leave, but, but all the new guys that are coming in with the great concepts, you know, they're really reaching back out with the older, with the old guy, like Elizabeth Blau, right. You remember Elizabeth, yeah, Mary yeah, Simon's partner. Yeah. So Elizabeth is, is now they're embraced. She's embracing them and they have all yeah. that sort of this camaraderie and they're all picking everybody up. They're helping each other and they're, Serving the community, yes, you know, that's kindness, you but they have Vegas, a business to run. Vegas always had a, a good uh, a good camaraderie amongst the chefs, even from all over the, the different cities. It was the, the city kind of brings you together anyway, because you're not necessarily, even though you're across the street in a different casino, it's, you're not, you're competing, but you're not across the street on, on 61st Street, New York, you know? Yeah, it's, no, it's, and, and everybody's happy. And there's always enough to go around. Chefs, listen, we're in a hospitality business, so we're usually people pleasers and givers, and we a bit of a show off, most of us, because that's what we do. And even amongst ourselves, there's, oh, there's a true professionalism and hospitality. When you go out to eat, chefs go to other restaurants, even if you've never met, you're treated as if, you know, you're a guest, you know, there's extra right. food, there's this and that. And you don't find that in other, other businesses. I mean, not a lot of businesses offer food and wine either, but, you know. It's still a great. It's a great, a great perk to be recognized there. Well, it's nice because it's come. You get the food and the wine, and then the, the celebrity part like comes with it. But to eat, but just because their name is is famous, right? Like Danielle, like you, like Jean George, like Carrie Simon was. They, you guys, you're humble because of your roots, right? It's very different. It's a different industry. Well, you know what? Honestly, I don't think that we think we're famous like that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> You know, no, it's I mean? true. Like, like people, people tell me I'm famous, and I'm like, well, maybe in the culinary world, but I, I don't really think of myself as famous. And I don't know. I, I don't think every other chef, you know, I think we know we're very good in our field and what we do, but we don't realize the amount of eyeballs on our brand the right. way others do because we're not normal citizens in the way that we don't sit home and watch TV and or, or uh, we're not regular consumers you know what i mean because right. we well, bo are like bobby bobby <laughs> might though bobby might know how many eyeballs are looking at him i mean i'm, I'm just <laughs> <laughs> okay i agree that's <laughs> and, he would, and he would agree with us too <laughs> he left no it's true so what so what are you working on now you are you what, what's happening so you're quarantined the restaurants are all closed well the restaurants in new york i can't even talk about because yeah the, can't even really open. So we're getting really hurt. My Jersey restaurants, four of them are all doing, oh, well, it's pouring rain today, but they're doing okay because they have some outdoor dining. When I say okay, it means we're, 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 we're skimming along. Right. We're, you know, we're not, but, and we have people at work. So we're, we're fortunate because we have more space than most others in New Jersey. And we're actually stealing other people's business. So unfortunately, if you don't have outdoor dining, mm -hmm. I happen to have lots of it and, and enough that you can't feed your base. So your base comes over to me and they can say, shit, we should come back here. You know, that we, we've never been here. It's an extra 10 minutes from our zone, our right. comfort zone, but you know what it's worth? It. So that's what's happening here. We're, we, we're opening in Charlotte next month. We're opening Oof. in Saudi Arabia. 
We're opening a couple more in New Jersey. We're putting a lot of boots on the ground in Jersey. We've got three more deals uh, in New Jersey, which is where I am now. I live down on the on near the beach in Jersey and also up North Jersey, where I grew up. <clears throat> and uh, and we're trying to do a, a, con- a pizza concept for Fast Casual. Uh, we're doing lots of, uh, you know, leftovers become a, ha- a hit. So I'm doing some virtual cooking classes with my puppet. I and, love it. Uh, I love it, too. It's fun, you know. And, I love uh, it. And then we, you know, we keep we keep working on stuff. You know, we we work very hard, my team and I, throughout the pandemic, trying to figure out what's going to happen when we do come out of this. How we're going to be racing. We had plenty of things already executed that got stalled, but now they're coming to life again. And uh, you know, we love what we do. Yeah. And we have a good team, and you know, we're uh, we understand what we do well and what we where we need help. And, uh, you know, we work hard. You know what? I, 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 we work hard. We work smarter than the old days. I don't have to tell you why. <laughs> well, do you feel that you have this, given this time right now, that you've had time to think a little more, I, time I to breathe? I that if this, the only silver lining in this is I've gotten, I've, I've learned to live in a wonderful home, which I've always, I used to get up and run to work and, and come home late. Now I take, you know, I work out a little. I drink my coffee. I enjoy this. You know, right. <laughs> and I got to tell you, there's no reason not to smell the roses. I and I can get. Listen, I'm on a, I'm on a, a call with you, and I did this all by myself. It's so beautiful. I, I can't. I couldn't believe it. And uh, you know what? I, I you know, we, slow down and get the job done correctly, and enjoy enjoy some stuff. And uh, I can I can work I can work from home. We're so programmed, at least my generation, of having to be at that restaurant before lunch every day. Make right. sure you're there for the counting the tickets and and, that. and you get that into your lifestyle to become. You think that without you being there, sometimes the place is going to burn down. It's not going to happen. So we hire better. We hire more responsible people so that my I can enjoy my time away from the restaurants and trust that they're in good hands. But I'll tell you this: watching there's your live stream with what you're doing with the cooking. Oh yeah, that I love it because I was lucky enough to become friends with you, right? And, and see that true you, right? In, in t- even when you were more relaxed, because coming right. to Vegas, it was, there was still, there was a, the best thing about having a restaurant in Vegas is everybody was pouring money into your pot, right? It was yeah. funny, but so you had a little bit, and it's nice to see that you could, you, it's nice to see you and you're not like flustered and running around and going from one place to another and the phone's ringing off the hook. Cause I've seen you in that environment too. It's one thing or another with all the restaurants. So it's, so I look at this, I'm like, wow, look at that. Look how good he looks. Look how happy he is. I mean, who has a puppet stuck to their arm? You got your hand up the rear end of something. I mean, it's the most beautiful thing I've ever seen. You know, it's interesting because he's got his own, like, he's, I mean, it's just fun. And it's almost as if he has his own personality sometimes. Crazy. Crazy. Well, he, he may need his own Instagram. He probably has his own fans. We're going to have to have he's him on him. paycheck, and he's a pain in the neck. That's he all that matters. But you know what? <laughs> I've had that idea for many years. And you know what? What? better time to do it it was just a, this is the time no so it's because it's and done it and we really started out just as a emotional message to people to hang in there and like you know we're gonna be okay and uh here's a meal that you should share with people and then all of a sudden it snowballed into something that's pretty interesting and, that's and beautiful. Uh, it's a good way to convey a message that's for sure yeah no and i you know listen i i know the so i still have my salt blocks you know i still have the right. salt blocks and everyone comes over like, what is that? I go, hey, don't touch that. It's in a little case. David Burke signed it. Don't get moisture on that thing. You leave that thing alone, right? But that was innovative, right? That's what it was all about. And then, yeah. you know, then you start seeing people are now cooking on them and doing the things that you were doing so long ago. I mean, there's even salt rooms here. Oh, we lost David. I think we had salted him with his salt block. Um, you got me there back you. yet? I got you. I don't have your face, but. That could be a good thing. I'm not sure. Yeah. <laughs> all right, we're going to have – that's all right. Don't worry about it. We're going to – I'll let you go. Thank you for the time, David. It was good catching up and seeing hey, you. We I appreciate really it. I really appreciate it. Anytime you want to talk, you let me know. Thank you so much. Have a great weekend. All right, buddy. You too. Wow, that was a fun show. I don't know what happened to Jennifer. She was uh, – who knows? We're going to find out one day. One day soon we're going to find out what happened to Jennifer because there she's gone. She's, I don't even know. Let's kick her out of the studio. Kick her from the studio. There she goes. She's out of here. All right. Thank you for watching today. It was a special edition with a special guy. And uh, thank you for the comments. Let me, I have to work the board at the same time I'm talking. 
and we'll see you soon.